Hello, my dear colleagues, and uh, hello, all the viewers and listeners of this uh, program. Um, our uh, topic today is about Brexit. Has Brexit weakened European security? But let me first tell uh, you that this is organized, this event is organized by um, True Story Project of the Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation of uh, GMF US in partnership with the network of Eastern and Southeastern uh, FANEL, uh, which is um, a project that was initially supported uh, by Black Sea Trust, and it is meant to support the presence in the media and in the internet and online of women experts in international relations, security, international economy, and so on. So um, our guests today uh, are uh, Alexandra Martin and Agnes Nicolescu. Uh, both of them uh, are very um, appreciated in their fields. And uh, just a few words about uh, each of them. Alexandra Martin is a uh, head presently head of Globsec uh, Brussels office since January uh, 2020. Uh, Globsec is a global think tank uh, well known uh, to people who are experts in this area. Uh, she joined the Globsec in May 2018 as strategic forums director and prior to that she worked as political and reporting officer acting political advisor for the OECE mission to Skopje. Previously was pol policy consultant for the German Marshall Fund of the US in Washington DC, where she provided expert uh, advice on topics such as transatlantic relations, security policy, Russia and the West and so on. Beforehand, she served in the European Union monitoring mission to Georgia as operations officer and she's a member of our SFNL network, Eastern and Southeastern European uh, FANEL network. Agnes Nicolescu, uh, I will start with her um, formal CV and uh, I will say that uh, presently she's project manager, uh, awareness raising and advocacy field for Habitat uh, for Humanity Romania. Previously, she held a number of um, High level positions in the private sector as well as uh, in, um, let's say, governmental uh, um, sector, if we count European Institute of Romania as being governmental, which it is. Uh, so she was senior associate uh, for um, uh, sustain analytics, uh, co corporate governance enhanced research team. Uh, she was head of business information for Sherban and Musnech Associates, public policy director for Aspen Institute Romania, and expert and acting head uh, studies and analysis unit for uh, European Institute of Romania. This was the capacity in which I first met Agnes. And recently she graduated with a doctoral degree in international relations uh, at uh, Babes Boya University Cluj Napoca. And her uh, thesis uh, is um, entitled uh, The United Kingdom's Commitment to the European Security Debates on the Brexit Process, Strategy and Decisions, Perspectives within UK, EU and NATO. So uh, as you can see, the, the two guests uh, of our debate today are, uh, have a high level of um, expertise in this issue of Brexit and security and the impact of Brexit on um, um, on Europe's, on European Union security. So I would like to start with the first question, um, which is the following. What was Britain's role in the EU defense and security before Brexit? So that we can have a kind of background of uh, what we are talking about and about the changes that happened once that uh, Brexit happened. 
uh, which actually happened uh, in the beginning of this month. Uh, so I would like to invite Agnes to, to ask, uh, to answer first. Uh, hello everyone and uh, thank you. My, my thanks go to uh, the German Marshall Fund uh, for hosting this timely conversation. Uh, it's a topic that has been on the mind of, uh, of many uh, ever since the Brexit uh, process started in, uh, in 2016, which finalized with uh, the UK's exit from, uh, from the European Union. Um, and uh, to, to answer Liliana's uh, question, I, uh, I would start uh, by pointing out to the fact that, uh, uh, for example, British military uh, assets and defense assets represent about a quarter of the EU's total capabilities, uh, according to, to a RAND report uh, dated uh, 2017. Um, at the same time, these capabilities being available through NATO formats and other cooperation formats. Um, and I would, uh, I would uh, further point uh, out to the fact that funding implications triggered uh, by Brexit could impact um, European security, but also British military forces uh, due to the emerging economic uncertainty. Uh, this economic uncertainty um, has also uh, impacted funding for the European defense uh, initiatives like uh, PESCO, CARD, and the European Defense Fund. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a telling fact that, for example, the original founding proposals, uh, funding proposals for these projects were far more substantial than the um, current amounts allocated for these initiatives. Um, so in my mind, the next, uh, the next question that arises uh, on how, for example, will the EU, uh, the UK and the US work in the post-Trump era um, so as to mend fences in the foreign and security policy area, uh, given the serious and profound misalignments that occurred um, in the past four years, which also coincided with the uh, onset of the Brexit process. Uh, that's a, a, a point that I would, uh, I would further uh, pick up on. Um, at the same time, the fact that the current US president uh, no longer questions American commitment towards NATO is already a big step. And um, uh, to get back to Brexit and its impact uh, in relation to European security, um, I, uh, uh, I would point out to the fact that the UK and the EU should make sure that their military forces remain interoperable uh, with one another, as well as with the US at the same time. Um, furthermore, joint efforts should, add, in this context, uh, target combating misinformation and hybrid uh, warfare campaigns that have been led uh, primarily by Russia. Uh, and at the same time, concerted military efforts um, and in order to achieve a genuine defense union, so much uh, um, supported and promoted, but uh, as a, at an objective level, would require more than ever uh, securing a common industrial base across re uh, European states. Uh, and this would involve stronger uh, industrial cooperation between member states, which is a big bone of contention uh, at EU level. Uh, and I'm sure here, uh, Alexandra <laughs> would, would, would like to, to pick up on and, uh, and develop. Um, and uh, this, uh, in my mind, triggers a set of, uh, of questions uh, as to what happens to Madeleine Albright's 3Ds uh, and what is the future of, and how can du duplication be avoided uh, and the overlapping uh, between uh, EU um, assets and um, uh, uh, NATO, you know, for cooperation format, so as to avoid um, uh, this overlapping, uh, which has, of course, been uh, again a, a point of tension uh, in the big, bigger discussion on how can Europeans achieve uh, strategic autonomy in relationship to the US. And of course, it's, uh, it's not a surprise that, um, uh, for example, the, the NATO Secretary General has uh, in the past and in the recent past, I mean, um, expressed its, uh, his um, uh, 
um, a reluctance towards uh, PESCO, towards European defense initiatives like PESCO uh, and CARD and the European Defense Fund, and uh, has asked questions as to whether these initiatives really um, can be integrated with NATO uh, greater um, defense efforts, or they are likely to, uh, in the long run, they are likely to, you know, to uh, further uh, drift, uh, make, make the EU and NATO drift apart further from one another. Um, that would be from me for, for now. So I see that uh, you already included NATO into the discussion and the transatlantic uh, dimension, which is inevitable. Um, we were talking before the, the event with Alexandra about this. So I would like to invite her to, uh, to answer uh, to the question and to what you just said, uh, Agnes. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana, and uh, the True Story Project. Uh, it, it's really great to be here. I'm, I'm always very um, uh, grateful and, and pleased to, to speak uh, in Romanian events, even though I've been away for so long. Um, let me pick up on, on your initial question on the role of Britain before Brexit, before actually 2016, or if we want to count 2020 as, as the end terminus. Um, and I would say that we need to be very much aware of the founding role that the UK had in, in the security and defense policy of the EU, and I'm referring back to 1998, the San Malo um, UK Franco Declaration of European uh, Declaration on European Defense, which was for the first time when there was uh, the, the, the need for credible military forces and readiness was actually brought into the conversation on how EU is moving forward in this new geopolitical environment. So uh, Britain had a founding role in what EU security and defense policy is today. Second point or second role was the, the um, invaluable contribution to the strategic culture and the strategic environment of the EU. As, as Agnes also mentioned, one fourth of the EU capabilities and forces were actually uh, UK, even though their contribution to CSDP mission, missions in general, both in terms of personnel and budget were, was rather limited compared to other countries. Um, they, they, they placed those assets that they had also within the EU context, but also in NATO context that I will, I will touch upon a bit later. Um, there was also the, the threat challenges and the perception of what's going on. And if we look at the 2016 EU global um, uh, security strategy and the 2015, the British uh, strategic defense and security uh, review, the, the, the analysis of the, the challenges and the security uh, issues coming uh, our way was actually the same. So you could see that the UK and the EU was at, or UK was integrated very much into the EU's common threat perception uh, lens. Um, then we had the muscle and the military credibility, including the nuclear um, capabilities, which cannot be taken out of the context in the end, uh, where EU is currently left with just one EU country having uh, nuclear capabilities. Um, the industrial policy that is very much developed compared to other most European countries, especially small and, and medium uh, member states, much newer, and I'm referring here more at the, the Central and Eastern European member states, and then of course research and, and uh, capital and money, the funding that was allocated. And if I could just go back to the latest uh, numbers, yeah, the UK defense budget for 2020 was 41.5 billion and the increase of 16.5 billion for the next four years, um, it's two, two and a half times more than the whole EDF budget approved through the multi-annual uh, multi financial framework for the EU 21, 2027. So, um, and there are two more points on, on the British role. And one is related to the range of bilateral and multilateral agreements that Britain had also outside the EU that actually reinforced um, the whole, um, um, uh, the, the capabilities and the, the, the capacity of EU to defense, to, to, uh, to react and to, to create a defense posture. And I'm here also uh, very much looking at E2Y, the, the European intervention initiative that was started with France and with 12 other uh, countries that are both either part of the EU or, or NATO, which will most likely continue to, to exist and develop outside the EU defense or NATO defense umbrellas. And then the last point would be on the EU-NATO cooperation and also the balance of power that UK brought to the conversations, both 
within EU and within NATO. Um, because in many, in many aspects, uh, the UK did opt out um, and that was not necessarily seen uh, always with good eyes uh, from, from Brussels perspective, but in the same time, it brought the counterbalance to either French initiatives that were not necessarily supported across uh, the EU. It brought uh, more um, negotiating uh, leverage in the relations to, to, to Germany, which has been pushed time and again in the last period to contribute more, um, both within the NATO 2%, but also on, in terms of European, um, European contribution. And then on, on the EU-NATO cooperation, I think that one of um, the great roles that Britain had also before, but will continue to have, is exactly that, not just the 3Ds, but also on how do overlapping will be avoided, how duplication um, will remain a problem for a time being, but considering the sizes of the budgets and the objectives of both um, long-term or uh, short-term operational, long-term strategic, how e EU will be able to actually create a credible defense force. Um, at this current pace, I think it will be the next 50 years when European strategic autonomy in terms of defense and security will be achieved, um, which is not yet the case. So that's why credibility of European defense to protect Europe against an external enemy or external threat is actually that confidence in, in EU citizens is very low compared to, compared to NATO. So this is where I will start with zooming out a bit and seeing the big picture on what the UK actually represented for the European security and what will be the, the move forward, uh, given that there is no contractual agreement, that there is no third party, very fixed way of engagement within uh, EDF, PESCO and, and so on moving forward and how UK will be able to fit probably interest based on their interests and needs into the European defense moving forward. Thank you, Alexandra. This was indeed uh, an overview uh, of uh, UK's presence and role and importance in uh, European security. Um, I was thinking of going a little bit uh, more into two distinct areas, first defense and then uh, security. And when it comes to <clears throat> defense, um, I found the following uh, assessment in uh, Rand Corporation uh, report, uh, and I will uh, quote here, uh, the immediate day-to-day -day impact of Brexit may be felt less keenly in defense than in other policy areas, such as trade, market regulation, or social policy. This reflects the continuing focus on the nation state as the primary actor on defense matters. So uh, my question here is, what do you think about this assessment? Uh, what would be the losses and the gains in terms of defense? Uh, maybe you would like to approach um, issues like defense spending, uh, research and industry uh, and uh, so on. So maybe maybe we'll, we will reverse the, the order and I will invite uh, Alexandra to, to say a few words. Yeah, I think it's still early on to see exactly how the, you, the Brexit impact will play on both defense and security. And I understand why you want to divide. For me, I still get them together because they're, I think they're interlinked on one hand, really uh, how many forces and how many, what type of capabilities and uh, readiness and deployment and so on. But on the other hand, the, the, the strategic culture and security beyond um, traditional defense. Um, so again, I think it's, it's very early on to assess the losses and the gains, but there are a few observations that I think are very important in this context. Um, NATO will be pivotal for the EU-UK relationship or will remain pivotal moving forward. Um, and I think that um, that will actually ease uh, the, the, the nature of the relationship moving forward, because there was no uh, um, very abrupt divorce. There was a deal, but until we got to that deal, there were a lot of sour tastes left around. So, and the fact that um, we do have some criteria for third party, third country contribution to, to, to PESCO EDF and so on, um, but that's actually a, a flexible, a rather flexible and tailor-made uh, type, of, uh, type of, um, of structure. Um, so NATO will remain, um, will remain key in how 
UK will continue to contribute to European security. And I don't see a withdrawal in any way, but the opposite, I think UK will continue to develop its posture and its leverage within NATO and will continue to engage bilaterally with selected member states um, across the EU and probably starting, of course, with the big with France as one of the closest allies and then moving towards east or south. Um, one of the, the, the losses or one of the, the challenging part will be the, the, the participation as a third country. And that's because it will be on, on UK's interest terms, because it's a bidding process. So I think that um, the, the Europeans will have, will see a loss in terms of knowledge transfer, industrial policy and the capabilities that companies in uh, UK could bring to the table in, in, in um, new development, new capability development, because UK will need to choose very carefully where to place their, their bucks to, to get the best out of it. Um, and that will also um, hit the, the whole idea of European industrial policy, because at the end of the day, they had a very big contribution to that. And without the UK, again, there will be a symmetry on how the, the industrial policy at the EU level will be, will be created. Then another loss will be the budget. Um, and uh, we see where we ended up with MFF. However, COVID uh, economic implications long term and the uncertainty at the, on the economic front um, plays another big role. But um, without the, the money coming from the UK, the, the, the EU budget got a, a relatively uh, big hit. Um, and then the um, contribution to CSDP, which again will be interest driven. There is a way for third countries to contribute to CSDP missions and operations. However, um, if will not be in the UK's interest or geographical areas of interest or for other strategic objectives, UK personnel and, and capabilities won't be there. And maybe last but not least, I think that um, one of the, the big challenges will be on bilateral coordination or, or the bilateral coordination and the attempt of Britain to have bilateral agreements with certain member states could lead to undermining the EU's strategic quest for strategic autonomy. Um, and that could the same way the US played that role, okay, let's have bilateral deals and let's undermine Brussels or, or EU. Um, that could also be a side effect of pursuing this bilateral or, or uh, minilateral arrangements that in the end won't play into the big, the big vision of e achieving EU strategic autonomy whenever that will happen. Um, and then we could also have a, a big discussion on between European strategic autonomy versus European sovereignty and who's behind what and what does that mean. Um, but I think that that's one of the areas where EU will show more restraint towards the UK in, 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 the defense, in defense matters exactly for the purpose of strengthening EU's posture and strategic autonomy compared like long term and being seen as a credible actor um, in, in the current formula. Yes, some some um, analysts are saying that actually uh, the Brexit is strengthening uh, the opportunities, let's say, for uh, strategic autonomy. Uh, and because you mentioned the uh, CSDP, I understand that uh, actually CSDP is not going, or the presence of uh, UK in CSDP is not that much diminished in the sense that uh, UK is participating to a number of, uh, and is going to be a partner in a number of operations within CSDP. So let me turn to uh, Agnes uh, for, uh, for a quick answer or longer answer as, as long as you wish on uh, defense matters, on losses, gains. Um. Yes, in terms of uh, of defense capabilities, I would uh, uh, I would just add that uh, the the UK remains one of the two European uh, states uh, with nucle nuclear capabilities uh, alongside France. Um, and from the perspective of the defense market, because it this sector uh, has a highly intergovernmental uh, dimension to it. Uh, access to EU defense markets may be uh, impacted, clearly disrupted by Brexit from, uh, uh, from the UK's perspective. Um, and here UK companies have already um, made efforts to orient towards increased uh, exports to, exports to non-EU partners. 
at the same time, the operationalization of Brexit uh, will involve, uh, to a certain extent, the setup of a new relationship between the UK and the European Defence Agency. Uh, we know from the past uh, of the European Defence Agency that uh, the big role that uh, the UK has played in uh, the design of its cultural um, legacy and in its uh, strategic uh, culture. Um, of course, in the past, London has been blamed uh, for opposing major uh, EDA uh, projects and initiatives. Uh, including as regards uh, a higher uh, budget for the agency. Uh, that is why uh, Brexit uh, is regarded by some member states as an opportunity, as a real opportunity to commit to an increased resource um, agenda for the EU in the defense sector. Uh, but here again, um, the divisions that have marked um, the union from the perspective of really pledging increased funds for defense uh, have overlapped with a bigger um, discussion and debate on what does the EU really want in terms of, of defense uh, and to what extent it can achieve that. Um, of course, in relation also to the agenda of pursuing a, a more autonomous uh, defense policy um, in relationship to the US. Um, I, yeah, uh, I would, I would stop here, maybe, uh, I would see the, the next point, uh, developing more on the relationship with the US, I know, <laughs> at some point. <laughs> um, in, in my, uh, list of, uh, questions, uh, I, I thought of, uh, approaching a number of issues related to security. Uh, and I have to say that I'm going to go a little bit aside of what I planned, just to ask, you know, what do you think would be the, the first, the main three um, security threats facing the European Union? And in what way Brexit affects EU's capacity to face them? I know it's a bit uh, off what we talked earlier, but I think it would be interesting you know, to be spontaneous in a way. Maybe um, I can I can go ahead. I don't, yeah. Um, so I think that the, the main, one of the main, when you asked me three, I have two in mind while I speak, I'll think of the third one. Um, the first will be the uh, not having a unified um, or a common threat perception or challenge or, or security uh, threat perception within the EU. If you look around at uh, top 10 security threats for Central and Eastern European country for countries for the Nordics, for the, for the Southerners or the Western Europe, you will see very, very, very different views on what affects um, the, 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 the threat perception when it comes to security. And that uh, will lead to more fragmentation and more division um, within the EU on what direction are you going. And I'm here talking both about China, I'm talking about Russia, I'm talking about migration and so on. The second uh, big threat will be climate change um, and the, the, the need for, for um, understanding the security implications of climate change and um, factor in the, um, the climate into our conversations about defense and security, moving from uh, disrupt, disruptions um, um, triggered by natural disasters to um, urbanization, to anything else. I think that there is very little conversation, especially in Central and Eastern Europe when it comes to, to the green uh, defense agenda. Um, we talk about climate more from the Green Deal perspectives and energy transition and buildings, and let's move from oil to renewable energy, but it is so much more to that conversation also when it comes to defense. And maybe I will say the third um, will be the emerging um, technologies. Um, this is something that actually Globsec works very closely with, with NATO currently on a private sector dialogue on understanding the, um, the contributions, but also the dual use technologies that could be developed, uh, not just for civilian purposes, that, that would have a military implications once they are misused or abused. Um, so looking from quantum to AI to a couple of others. So the whole issue of how do we deal with emerging technologies and their
contribution to defense and security uh, without putting our humanity at risk. I, that those would be my top three. And I think that there are there is a lot going on at the European level, conversations in Brussels and beyond, um, discussions between EU and NATO on this, especially on the, the uh, emerging technologies, but also on, on the green defense side. Um, and probably the biggest challenge will be the internal one of having a common um, understanding of what's ahead of us and um, not really sure that we will all be on the same page. So various forms of uh, mini lateral cooperation within the EU uh, probably will be one of the ways, for, ways forward with various constellations of countries dealing with specific strategic threats that directly impact their, um, their security and their immediate uh, neighborhood. It's very interesting uh, that you put on the first place this lack of common vision and uh, uh, of priorities of, uh, in terms of security at the European level. Uh, and it comes to my mind that basically Brexit in this respect diminished a little bit the uh, coherence, <laughs> the incoherence or the lack of common vision uh, because, um, yes, because of many, uh, many reasons, I'm not going to enter into details now. Uh, and then when it comes to the planet change, maybe we lost uh, a voice, an important voice in terms of pressing for uh, taking care of the climate and of planet change, uh, because I think that the UK uh, had a fairly strong voice in this respect. Um, well, but they, I don't they, know what to say about the third one. I think that we also lost that because if we are we looking at where the innovation and where the the, the capital comes and where the um, the startups and the new ideas within Europe, uh, UK was one of the leading pole, leading poles. Um, but we could also see from their national plans and from their ways moving forward on everything they do on AI, the, the national strategies on space, which um, is way ahead and. and uh, scoring closely behind the United States together with France. So um, on all the new areas where, where technology will be embedded in, in the future of how we, how we are um, uh, carrying out our defense uh, and security policies, which most countries in the EU don't even have the, they are not even at the, the first step in, in that, the whole uh, uh, picture. And they already have, um, not just national strategies, but actually funds allocated and, and, and credible um, force allocation. Thank you, Alexandra. So I turn now to Agnes about the security threats for the European Union and the relationship with uh, Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, I would start, uh, I would start actually from a UK perspective in order to see how this relates or not to, to European concerns in, in matters of foreign and security policy and what is really a threat to European security and sovereignty uh, of member states. Um, and I would pick, uh, I would pick up uh, on, uh, on several uh, survey polls that have been conducted in the UK uh, ever since the Brexit uh, process started in 2016, so very recent surveys and what, what uh, was surprising uh, and not at the same time about these polls uh, were the cont contrasting opinions between, for example, foreign and security experts and practitioners uh, and the general public, so the general audience. And um, for example, P uh, experts from the Chatham House were really involved in highlighting these, uh, these uh, and commenting these uh, opinions. and. Uh, on the one hand, the general public saw uh, as um, major threats to UK security, uh, one that was already mentioned by Alexandra, uh, climate change and uh, international terrorism was, was the second one. But I think that climate change was on top of their concerns, followed by international terrorism and uh, uh, the advance of uh, non-state actors. Uh, while uh, foreign and security policy experts highlighted, and here I must say that their opinions uh, were more in line with concerns in Central and Eastern Europe, um, foreign and security policy experts in the UK 
pointed out to Russia's ag aggressiveness and assertiveness in, in the Europe's East as a big uh, security challenge uh, to China, of course, and uh, the rise of um, illiberal moves, movements in general. Uh, and here, of course, we, we can have a, um, a larger conversation on what illiberalism means and how this has been impacted by uh, what has happened in the US in, uh, uh, in the recent, uh, <laughs> in the very recent past, in, in, the, <laughs> in the recent months. Um, but I would, I would uh, put a positive spin on it and hoping that uh, what happened would not, uh, would not reiterate again. Um, I cannot help but, uh, but think about the process that has started uh, in, in the EU, now going back to, to the, uh, Europe's uh, perceptions on, uh, on its security and to the conclusions of the um, uh, European uh, Union uh, Global Strategy of 2016, which was the process of uh, a broader uh, conversation and consultation uh, in member states. Uh, also with think tanks, I remember that um, at that moment, many think tanks were, uh, were asked to give uh, opinions. And uh, to, I would highlight uh, one topic that feeds into the bigger uh, conversation that is present now, and uh, that is whether the return of multilateralism at European level and in the in international relations is a trend that is likely to continue and to um, uh, put a mark on the future of EU US cooperation. And we, we can add to that EU UK cooperation in the foreign and security policy area. Uh, because, of course, Brexit, uh, if we are to look at it, is expected to, to give more. Uh, more boost to bilateral um, uh, relations and to enhance. Uh, bilateral dialogue between the UK and various member states rather than in a, a unified uh, European um, um, format. And how uh, this can converge with, um, with a um, higher focus and high respect for the values of multilateralism in international relations. And I would, uh, <laughs> I would be curious in. <laughs> yes, you you mentioned two words which are kind of a trigger for me: multilateralism and illiberalism. Of course, two different things, but uh, just came to my mind. You know, maybe one of the threats, important threats to to our continent or our organization, the European Union, is the fact that we are the states are actually losing control uh, of, in terms of legitimacy in favor of institutions which are not elected like churches and other kind of influencers, which are not controlled by democratically elected bodies. And this is to be seen definitely in uh, Central Eastern Europe uh, maybe less so in Western Europe, but then in Western Europe, there are other issues uh, related maybe to uh, uh, Islam and uh, all kinds of manifestations deriving from funda fundamentalists, which again, they are less in, states are less in control of, of this. Um, now, um, to return to our agenda, if you have anything to, to uh, uh, add, maybe, in terms of um, security, when it comes to cybersecurity and intelligence, whether the um, exit, uh, Brexit, uh, in what way it influenced and it influences EU security in terms of cybersecurity and intelligence? I will pick up, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on cyber um, whatsoever, but I, I go back to my point on, on NATO and the framework that NATO provides. Um, cyber is one of the operational domains of NATO, the fifth one, so a lot of the developments um, happen there. Um, there is a cyber agency within the EU, but doesn't necessarily deal directly with defense and security portfolio, so that's more on, on, on the NATO dom domain side. And then the, the intelligence sharing um, will happen probably again 
for for um, or within within NATO parameters. I cannot talk about Europol and, and other types of frameworks. I I don't really know if, if um, they are fully set up in the uh, post uh, Brexit um, agreement. Um, but I'm I'm confident that at least when it comes to to military issues and, and traditional defense, but also beyond, NATO will serve as the platform for intelligence sharing and pulling capabilities for for domains like like cyber. But I do want to make a point on on what Agnes said a bit before on um, UK multilateralism return and so on. And I I do think that the um, elections in the United States, the outcome of the elections in the United States um, had uh, influenced dramatically the course of the, the EU-UK relationship because um, the return of a friend and supportive of multilateralism and of the EU, Joe Biden, as, as president of the United States, um, set a new tone for how the UK-US relationship will be moving forward. And he made a very um, a big point since before November, since before he became president-elect, that um, the relationship with the US-UK will not undermine the relationship between, between EU and the UK. So I think that that political message has been, has been very much um, listened to on the Downing Street. Um, and of course, it unpacks multiple elements from the Good Friday Agreement, the relationship with Ireland, and so on, but also to the need of, of Joe Biden to regain the trust and, and support of European allies when it comes to moving or restoring and giving a new, um, a new, yeah, a new level of energy and new definition to the transatlantic relationship. And uh, that would have not happened if the UK would have been, of the, the UK EU relationships would have gone completely off road. Um, and would have been no agreement whatsoever on how this cooperation will continue to look like. So um, I think that the, the US actually played a very big role on, on how uh, EU-UK relationship uh, turns out to be and will continue to develop. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, Agnes, would you like to say something about this area? Thank you. Um, yes, just picking up on your question uh, uh, on um, uh, the impact uh, in terms of intelligence uh, mechanisms and cooperation formats in this uh, in this uh, area, um, I uh, I found very uh, very interesting the um, uh, the fact that, for example, some uh, intelligence high level officials um uh, mentioned and uh, assessed that brexit's impact on the uk's intelligence sharing uh, formats uh is estimated not to be uh, so high uh, given the fact that most intelligence cooperation uh, and sharing formats are uh, conducted in uh, in bilateral formats and um uh, i'm thinking here of a of a statement made by uh, sir richard dearlove uh, former head of, uh, of MI6, uh, who stated that Brexit would bring two potentially um, important security gains. Uh, and one would be the ability to, to give up on the Europe European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, and on the other hand, greater control to give up greater control, uh, sorry, uh, have greater control over immigration from EU member states. Um, so it's uh, <laughs> it's the um, give and takes, you know, uh, logic of uh, uh, and also one of the fundamental uh, motivations, if we are to think about the internal discussion within the UK on why uh, and uh, one of the main reasons uh, of the Brexit debate in the first place, uh, because if we uh, we should uh, not forget that Brexit. Um, uh, emerged as an internal politics uh, debate. Um, see the concerns via immigration from Eastern Europe and <laughs> um, how this uh, uh, climaxed into, into such uh, deep consequences for, for the greater uh, foreign policy and strategic uh, implications. So it's, um, it's, it's, still kind of a um, surprising and recent phenomenon 
uh, that uh, many researchers are still looking into and experts and uh, uh, the, the implications of the internal politics uh, on to the, the greater relationship and the, the broader relationship between the UK and the EU in so many uh, areas uh, is still, is still uh, under exploration, so to say. Uh, and in, in many areas, the impact is still quite, uh, quite difficult to, to assess, as was, was already mentioned. And I would not uh, go uh, very much into the cybersecurity discussion, uh, but again, the, given the, um, um, uh, the expertise and the strong assets that the Brits had brought to the table in terms of uh, uh, intelligence, uh, um, data uh, design, and uh, not so much sharing, because there had been uh, significant criticism in the past about the Brits' reluctance to actually share with European <laughs> members. Um, so it's it's kind of uh, you know seeing the uh, the reverse of the medal, uh, if we can uh, put it that way, um, uh, of the Brexit and uh, uh, with the Brits not getting so much after all uh, out of uh, out of the, out of this, um, but the the overall assets that they brought in terms of defense and uh, military capabilities are. Uh, cannot be ignored by, by any means. Thank you, Agnes. In, in terms of uh, sharing um, intelligence, I understand uh, from some recent uh, analysis that basically uh, the situation is um, a matter when it comes to cross-border security and uh, to fighting terrorism, uh, UK is actually going, is leaving Europol. It already left Europol and some initiatives in terms of uh, justice and internal affairs. So there are some um, databases which are, uh, um, which are not going to be shared any longer between uh, UK and uh, EU. And uh, one uh, senior uh, official, EU official, says that it's a lose-lose situation in this respect. Uh, but going a little bit back to uh, trilateral that you mentioned at some point, uh, UK, EU, and US, uh, let me enlarge this trilateral to talk about EU, UK, and NATO. What would you say significantly, what do you think that is the most significant thing that you can say about this triangle in which way Brexit actually uh, impacts on the I know, relationship between the EU and its uh, strategic uh, autonomy ambition and, and NATO? So should I start? I would say one thing that we've observed and um, it has been um, visible politically with the participation of NATO Sec Jens Stoltenberg to the, the meeting of the European, of the, the Commission uh, College, the Commissioner, um, which happened also in, in December. So what I can say is that the EU-NATO cooperation and relationship is moving towards more cooperation, less duplication, more coordination and less fragmentation. So I think that within this um, relationship, that's where, where UK will, will, will play a part, of course, this time indirectly. So on one hand, being a, a full uh, a NATO member and everything that comes from, from that perspective. And on the other hand, having a third country relationship with, with the EU. So I'm, I'm not any longer that, um, that not threatened, but I don't have so many worries about this relationship because I do feel and I saw the, the progress that has been made um, towards more cooperation and more dialogue between EU and NATO. Is it far from what it should be? Yes, of course. Um, but it's, it's moving in the right direction. And that's because there is both the momentum and there is also leadership on both sides of, of the aisle to actually get uh, this dialogue started. Um, but I, I don't know if you want to go to Paul, uh, Paul Hurmuza's question uh, from Q&A, because I think that he, he um, 
brings a good point now, and I would like to to answer to some of it. But maybe Agnes, you want to to first tackle on on the triangle or on the duo. Okay, so let's go to Agnes, and then uh, we'll go to the question of Paul Formos. Um, yes, thank you. I uh, I uh, share uh, Alexandra's uh, opinion that we we should not um, be uh, too much too concerned about uh, the future uh, if involvement of uh, and possible uh, drifting away of the UK from um, uh, from European member states who are also members of NATO and um, the, the way that uh, their opinions may converge. Um, because for the UK, uh, participation in NATO uh, decision-making processes and in the decision-making structures remains a core pillar of their uh, foreign and security policy. Um, and uh, many British experts and uh, um, officials uh, state that it's, uh, it's more than likely that they will focus and increase actually their commitment and their participation uh, in this format. So in, in the NATO format. Um, of course, I cannot help but, uh, but think about the, the positive effect that the changing of the, that the changing in the US administration will, will have on this. Um, and uh, of the fact that um, one, one way in which uh, the future cooperation in this uh, triangle may, uh, may go on in the future will be by uh, further alliance seeking from the British uh, and further engagement with member states who maybe in the past were uh, sometimes overlooked, uh, such as states in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, but again, this will be, um, as in the past, maybe will also uh, give way to more uh, bilateral uh, uh, substance, which cannot, however, be, um, cannot go beyond the, the NATO format. Um, that would be all from me on, uh, on this point. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you both Agnes and Alexandra. So yes, well, let's go to this question uh, that we got from uh, Paul Hormuz. I'm not going to read it because everybody has it, but, but it actually is pointing to this tension between the views of, the, of Germany uh, through the voice of uh, uh, defense minister and uh, the viewpoint of France when it comes to the strategic autonomy. Uh, so uh, what, what would you, how would you react to this? It's, oh, I mean, in a way, uh, uh, when I first read the, the question, I was thinking of uh, the, the history of France, uh, France's uh, uh, initiatives in terms of uh, European defense, uh, even going back to the 50s uh, with the European army and everything. Uh, and uh, just to to notice that actually they initiated it and then they uh, they themselves uh, backed uh, away. Uh, I'm not saying that this is going to happen now. I'm just pointing out that there is a history in terms of uh, France's involvement in the in the autonomy and in the um, kind of uh, European defense as being uh, separate from uh, from U.S. Uh, and from NATO. So, what do you think? Um, so my, my very short answer is how this mismatch uh, will play forward will be a model through scenario. And um, I, will, I will try to break it down into, into multiple elements. So if we look on, on the German side, yes, AKK statements and strong support toward NATO are well known. They are not entirely um, supported across the board on the political spectrum in Germany, uh, even within CDU and with the change in, in, in political leadership, we'll need to see where that goes. Um, however, we also saw a bit of a shift and a bit of a, um, of a change in the narrative coming from Germany when it comes to full reliance on the US for protecting European security um, architecture. So, there is movement on, on the German side or coming from, from Germany when it comes to what type of um, European preparedness and response should be available um, for Europeans uh, in case 
a, a Trump or a Trump-like um, president will come in the future after Biden, because the, the opinions are very divided if Biden, who's the outlier, the Trump or the Biden? So what will happen in, in 2024 is yet to be seen. And um, there is an increased acknowledgement that Europeans cannot be left again at the, at the door waiting to see how US will or not um, commit to defend Europeans under Article 5 of NATO. So that's happening on, on the German side. On the French side, um, I think that Mr. Macron's vision, um, while, while very great, and you could draw back on the goal, French history, the last, the last century, and, and so on. On the other hand, um, he did not really um, galvanize enough support for his whole idea of sovereignty and the word sovereignty, because that's what French use, um, sovereignty and not strategic autonomy, is actually not playing well uh, with many of the member states, including Germany, but also if we look at Central and Eastern European countries, which are very much fond of the US strategic relationship with, with US and NATO as the main protector and as the main uh, security umbrella. Um, so I don't think that the, we will see a change in Macron's narrative towards European sovereignty. I think many of the ideas that go beyond defense and security have been translated in terms of trade, in terms of tech regulation at, at other levels. And we see that coming from Brussels, which are directly a commission or EU prerogatives and not a national uh, member state um, uh, prerogative. But we need to, uh, to keep in mind that Mr. Macron is also um, up uh, his alley. The, the, the elections in France will play a very big um, influence when it comes to his narrative and his attention, domestic versus um, international. Um, and then there is a, a third, I would recommend a rather short uh, opinion piece by Hans Kudani from, from Chatham House, I think it was from last week, which is called European Sovereignty Without Strategic Autonomy which is a very interesting um, um, point of view where it says that Europeans want to move forward with the idea of being more independent in decision-making and having control over manufacturing, production of strategic assets, supply chains, and so on and so forth, but taking decisions independently of the United States. But when it comes to strategic autonomy in the traditional understanding, which is related to defense and security, that will likely not be the case. Now, how will that play in another triangle that I will bring forward, which is UK, which is US, EU, China? That will be the um, because that's where the Americans uh, have the expectations that the EU will move in the right direction in, in their policy towards China, while the EU seems to be very reluctant and wants to craft a completely different course of action. Um, so they are interlinked of decoupling efforts uh, started from, from, from Brussels. Um, my model through scenarios is that um, at one point, um, both sides, or we won't meet in the middle, Eastern and Western Europe or France and Germany, um, but there will be a, a cohabitation model where um, everyone will pursue their, their big words and the narratives, but in the same time, they will, they will try to bring to the table um, the, the, their interests and the needs and also the capabilities to, to back that up. Um, but it won't be a full alignment. Interesting what you pointed out. It just came to my mind because you included in a new triangle, uh, including China. Um, and I was thinking to what extent does European Union have uh, um, an economic security autonomy in terms of, you know, dealing uh, autom autonomously uh, in terms of trade investments uh, with China, uh, because it doesn't look like, in a sense, uh, I, I, I'm not going to elaborate on this, but I think we all know that uh, this is, you know, the, the, the way in which uh, the relationship between EU and uh, China evolved uh, in the last two months, basically, um, and it, it coincided with the change of presidency in the, the US, um, shows something, is, is meaningful somehow. Uh, but let me go uh, to, uh, to Agnes uh, to, to invite her to, to answer the question, basically, in whatever she would 
way she would like to. Um, yes, yeah, speaking upon uh, Paul's uh, question uh, and uh, the the so much desired and sought out uh, strategic autonomy, it's really difficult to 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 discuss about strategic autonomy for the European Union without uh, a solid conversation about the need for sustainable uh, burden sharing. Uh, as uh, as called out by many by by the U.S. and uh, and some member states, uh, but opposed by by uh, many other member states, uh, it's a long needed uh, conversation. And um, uh, picking up on also on uh, uh, Alexandra's mentioning of the and your uh, uh, comment on uh, on the triangle EU, UK, China. Um, I would. Uh, uh, I, I'm thinking here about um, a conversation which has started uh, in uh, in the UK ever since the the Brexit process started about uh, needed uh, uh, rethinking, uh, reshaping of the UK's foreign and security policy and uh, redefinition of their priorities and their own autonomy in relationship to the US. Uh, which has uh, come to me uh, in some ways as a surprise, but for many uh, British uh, experts and, uh, and diplomats, this is a recurring topic uh, recently about uh, the need for, uh, for London to, to rethink uh, foreign and security policy, not necessarily uh, attached or always associated to that of the US. And here, uh, the, the bone of contention was China and um, uh, many, um, many experts uh, talking about this uh, topic um, when asked about the UK's future security policy priorities said that uh, the UK should refrain from joining the US in containing China at all costs. And this was really uh, <laughs> a surprising finding but uh, for many British uh, respondents, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, more appropriate and more uh, opportune. I, I don't know if it's a word in English, but it sounds uh, somewhat uh, appropriate for this uh, uh, conversation. Um, the, that uh, they said that London should focus on uh, striking a more balanced and transactional objectives. Uh, and this is a, uh, if I recall well, it's it's a study from the Royal uh, Institute from RUSI. Um, yes, I, I use it as a reference in my paper, so <laughs> it's quite it's quite recent. Um, so again, this transactional uh, uh, dimension that many forget about the the British foreign and security policy thinking is somewhat uh, resurfacing in, in the whole discussion. It looks to me that it's not only a triangle, or we are talking not only in triangles, we are also talking in squares or quadrilaterals, because now we have US, UK, EU, and China. Well, may, maybe this is going to be a subject for another discussion. I would like to uh, ask you a short question at the end. Uh, very uh, brief and very much pointed to the to the object of our overall discussion, which is: Is the European Union more secure or less secure now after Brexit actually took place? I don't think that the level of security increased or decreased uh, post Brexit. I don't think again. Uh, while there are um, losses and gains in very specific uh, forces, credibility and so on, we, we still look at European security through the, NATO, through the NATO umbrella and nothing has changed there. But the opposite, um, uh, with the, the arrival of Joe Biden at the, the, the White House, we have the firm commitment on, on Article 5 from the US, which was under question uh, for the last uh, four years. So uh, I think that our level of security um, will be or is affected by other external factors, but I do not necessarily see a huge um, influence uh, caused, caused by, by Brexit. Um, I think that we will 
look and see what the strategic compass, uh, I didn't touch upon it, but I think will be an, an interesting document um, for, for 2022 or end of this year, um, when we are evaluating European ambitions against the threats and, and the common uh, perception, uh, the common threat perception. So uh, we'll have to see where we take it from there. But I don't feel more or less secure either as an individual or as European um, just because of Brexit. Thank you, Alexandra. Agnes, what, what would be your answer to this question? Because you, you obviously analyzed this uh, from many viewpoints. Maybe it's going to be more difficult to summarize. No, oh, I'll, uh, I'll keep it short. Um, and also with bearing uh, to, to um, uh, what uh, British military and diplomatic uh, uh, professionals or practitioners have uh, focused on in relation to um, perceived threats, because this would be the, the key um, uh, the key point in relation to, to your question, what is perceived as a key threat to European security or to UK's security for that matter. And um, uh, regardless of Brexit, um, most concluded uh, that it's essential to preserve a credible balance of force against uh, all um, external challenges, be that um, um, international terrorism, uh, but also um, Russia, uh, as mentioned by foreign and security policy experts in the UK. And uh, um, this is not a topic which was present in, uh, in uh, surveys and uh, polls conducted, but I would add that uh, um, the rethinking of uh, and uh, um, the way that um, liberalism will uh, will shape up international relations has uh, uh, a lot to do with uh, the manner in which uh, the foreign and security policy agenda will shape up uh, in in recent in next in the next uh, period for the EU and for the UK um, uh, alike. And again, uh, it was already pointed out the uh, the role of the U.S. in the whole equation is not uh, is not to be overlooked. That would be all for me. Thank you, Agnes. It uh, it surfaced several times the role of the change of president in the U.S. So I have to to emphasize this in the end uh, that this is a plus, an important plus to. Uh, EU security and especially to, to Romania, I believe. Um, I think we touched many, many uh, aspects of the impact of Brexit on EU uh, security and maybe we created some premises for future debates. Uh, I, I would like to thank you, both of you, for your spontaneity, for your knowledge, for your time for everything that you involved in, uh, in this discussion. Uh, Agnes Nicolescu and Alexandra Martin, uh, thank you very much uh, Black Sea Trust and the True Story Project for uh, supporting this event, uh, creating this uh, um, uh, online environment. And I do hope that our networks Eastern and Southeastern uh, Fennel Network will flourish. And I promised myself that I will uh, do my best to organize every month uh, one, uh, one debate on an interesting topic uh, for all of us in international relations. And thank you very much for our uh, participants who, who attended this event. All the best. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, you too.